This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. And welcome, everybody, to this broadcast of Coming Home with John Allen. I am your humble host, John Allen. And today I have with me Mr. Travis Peterson. He's a great guy, an American expat here in Norway, and author of Ada and the Helpers. How you doing, my brother? Doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, I came across your story, and I'll, I'll call it your story. It's your life story, your family story, the story of your daughter. And you're one of the rare people who take that life story and put it in print. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and this is a very broad question, but tell me how that happened. Yeah. So, um, well, the, the whole story is, uh, we have, uh, my wife and I have two kids. Um, our youngest kid, Esther is, uh, she was born deaf. And so from that, um, you know, we all grieve in different ways. So, uh, I, I, I wanted to do, I wanted to use that experience to make the world better somehow and to help others. And so that's actually kind of the theme of the whole story. And so, um, this, this story of Ada and the helpers kind of came out of this, um, this period of, of going through everything we've gone through so far with Esther. And um, it's, it's been quite a ride for sure. So, so Esther was born deaf. Um, at what point, how old was she, I guess, when you all first started taking steps towards getting her some hearing aid? Yeah, well, it was... Because that's a big part of the story, about which yeah. is getting that aid and how it affected her. But how mm. old was she when you first took the first steps? It was within the first couple of months after she was born that she had some initial hearing tests, which I think is pretty common with every kid. And, yeah. and she failed those tests. And so we were told then it was probably some fluid in her ears, you know, it, don't start worrying at this point. And um, so I think she was about three or four months old when, when I realized we realized that this could be real. And so that's, she went through a couple more hearing tests and uh, then shortly after that, probably at about five months or so, she was fitted with hearing aids. And um, at nine months, she received cochlear implants. What's a cochlear um, implant? Please explain that to my sure. viewers and listeners. Sure. It's uh, actually, I have some, some fake ones here that I can show you. Um, because you, here's another, here's one thing that yeah. just totally endeared me to you just to take a little sidestep. Uh, you had a period and I'm kind of jumping ahead, um, to how these hearing aids affected your daughter at one point. And in order to support her, you were wearing those right points. there. Yeah. Yeah. And that just endeared me to you. That's like, this, this is a father with a big heart who's doing the best he can to help his daughter and, and comfort her. And I just thought it was beautiful. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So cochlear implants are, they look like hearing aids, maybe a little bit larger than your standard hearing aid. They have quite a big battery attached to them. And, um, uh, they, uh, they have this wire attached to a magnet that, connects to the head and um, the magnet connects to an, an implant inside the head, okay. which then sends the signal into the ear. So it is a surgical, it is a surgical implant. It's not just something that sits inside the ear canal. It's surgically implanted into the body. Right. Exactly. Um, so these can be removed, you know, yeah. with no problem and, and we have to replace the battery just about every day and things like that. So it's, it's kind of an advanced hearing aid. Um, I, I like to think of them, you know, that she'll always be deaf. That's, that's something we have to deal with. Yes. And, and a lot of people think, oh, she has these implants now. She can hear. She's not deaf anymore. That's not true. She'll always be deaf. And, and sometimes we have to take these implants off, like when she's taking a bath or when she's sleeping. And it's at those points where we need to use sign language to communicate with her. And, uh, but, but it's just like if you could give someone who is legally blind glasses so that they could see, 
You know, that's, that's what I like to think of them as. I see. That's uh, an interesting way of looking at it. I've yeah. never heard it explained like that before. That's very interesting. Yeah. So it's, um, they're, they're good helpers, but they don't cure her completely. Right. She's always going to be deaf. That's, uh, that's quite the, that's quite the direct statement. Um, hmm. do you feel that it's something, you know, how, how old is she now? She's three and a half. She's three and a half. So for for three and a half years, this has been the situation for your daughter and for the rest of the family. Do you think this is always going to be something that you have to, quote, deal with? Or is it going to become or has it become just a normal part of your family life? Do you see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah, it's in one way. It is kind of a normal part of our life. You know, we go through everyday things and um Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot has changed except, you know, changing batteries and things like that. But uh, there's going to be seasons in her life where she's going to face questions. Um, we we hope and pray that she never faces any kind of bullying, but that's a possibility. With sure, like sure, so, absolutely. Yeah. Kids, so are, other kids, kids in a sh- in a social sense are both uh, extremely accepting, but they're also extremely prone to that poking and prodding around the aspect of bullying. So she's probably going to see a mixture of both acceptance and bullying. Um, How, how do you as a father prepare her for that? I'm still wondering that myself. You know, she's, She's only three at this point. But, well, uh, my, and, and my kids here at home are only 16 and 14, but I'm still, try, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, it's a never ending process. Yeah. It's a state of constant preparation of your children. Mm-hmm. So yeah, get ready. You've got another 15 years or so of, right. of trying right. to prepare her for life. Yeah. I, I will say that, um, you know, even before she was born, we felt like she would be, a girl and a woman of strength and courage. And uh, so encouraging that courage yeah. in her uh, throughout her childhood and into her adulthood is, is really, I think, the best way to um, sort of combat that future possibility. Of, oh, amen. Know, Absolutely. It's all about, uh, it's, it's all about support from the family. Exactly. It's all, all about support in all ways. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. How, how were, how did you tackle the issue of communication? Okay. You have a child, they're deaf, verbal communication, people take it for granted. Mm. Now all of a sudden you don't have that. Yeah. How did you tackle communication? Because you, you weren't, you weren't knowledgeable about sign language. You had to learn it. You're probably still in the process of learning. So Absolutely. how did you get, how did you tackle this issue with communication? Yeah, you know, when when she was very young, before we even knew there was an issue, we would sing to her and, and talk to her and all those things. Yeah. And then suddenly we find out she hasn't been hearing any of this. Let and me stop so, you there. How did you yeah. how did you find out that she wasn't hearing? What was it that made it click for you that Yeah. So I think we I think she was about three months old mm-hmm. and uh, we, we knew it was a possibility because of these tests that she yeah. had, but, uh, there was one evening when my wife's parents came over for dinner and shortly after they came in the door, there was a sudden loud sound and I don't remember what it was. Yeah. You would think a baby would jump yeah. at a sound like this yeah. and there was nothing. And John, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. It doesn't take much for me to cry. You know, I cry at commercials. Um, it was all I could do to hold it in till my in-laws were gone. And, and then, you because know, you kinda, knew that, yeah, yeah, I could tell, you know, it, it just in my heart of hearts, I knew that this was life for us. And so I told my wife and, and that's kind of what started the next round of testing and all of that. Okay. So, so then, you know, singing and talking isn't quite the same, but we kept doing it. because ah, I see. Yeah, because we didn't want to get into the habit of not talking to her for one thing. Yeah. But also we, we, even the fact that, I'll tell you, John, she, when she was that young and couldn't, didn't have her cochlear implants, 
she had this way of grabbing your attention with her eyes. I mean, she was <sighs> constantly staring at us and smiling. And so she was very attentive, very, you know, aware of her surroundings. Sure, sure. So by talking and probably that. having that natural uh, child or that natural infant newborn curiosity. And of course she's yeah. not hearing the sounds, but she is seeing the movement right. and she's connecting the movement of your mouth and your eye contact probably with some form of communication, I would assume, exactly. which is a beautiful thing. Meaning yeah. that uh, just because, and, and we hear this very often, just because the one sense is cut off does not mean that it's to the necessary detriment of that individual, yeah. it means that they can potentially build on other senses. In this case, the child paying more attention to facial, you know, uh, facial movement, mouth movement, eye contact. Yeah, everything else is heightened, and I think that's why um, sign language works so well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so we started using baby signs um, early on, and. Uh, there's some programs here in Norway to help you kind of get started with that. And so then we started learning Norwegian sign language and uh, with a little ASL mixed in. Yeah. And I, I hope to strengthen that in the future. Um, so it's, uh, I would love to be going to like weekly classes, but right now it, it works where um, you only go for like every six months you go to a week long class. That's that. it. Yeah. Is that yeah. enough? Are you, is it? I would really love to have more. Yeah. I, I don't feel like it's enough, but um, we are learning. So that's, that's good. But uh, I don't so, feel like we're learning fast enough. So at what level, you know, just des describe the communication now, you know, everybody in your household now is, is learning sign language um, mm. and, and, and developing uh, uh, your interfamilial -fami communication. How is mm -hmm. it going now? It's going beautifully. Like, uh, so we're, we're a multicultural family. I'm American. My wife is Norwegian. Our son was born in the U S Esther was born here. And, uh, so when she got her cochlear implants, it was just within a month or so that she said her first word mama. And, um, by last year, in uh, preschool, Barnahagen, that we call it here, um, they were they were saying that she is sort of the model of communication in her Barnahagen. That's beautiful. Yeah. So she's she was speaking very well, and and uh, she's learning English and Norwegian. She can say a sentence in Norwegian to my wife and repeat it in English to me, and uh, she's of course learning uh, Norwegian sign language. And like I said, little ASL mixed in. So, so she's crushing the myth, uh, as did, uh, my two kids here crushing that oh. myth that says that kids get confused when they're trying to learn different languages. Both of my kids are 100% bilingual. They mm -hmm. speak, I've demanded since day one that they speak only English with me. And I speak only English with, mm -hmm. well, I speak only English here at home, period. I speak Norwegian when I'm out and about, but here at home, just English. The kids are 100% bilingual. And here's your daughter, 100% bilingual, both mm -hmm. spoken and she's learning both sign languages. Yeah. Kids, yeah. kids are pretty tough. It's amazing. How kids much are pretty smart cool. and versatile. Yeah. 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 So now you're saying everything is going well, but are there any challenges with communication as it stands now? Well, you touched on it earlier. Uh, we did face a big challenge this past summer. Uh, we were on vacation, and um, Esther was playing in a bedroom with, with her brother, Aiden, and uh, she fell and hit her head right where the implant is. Ah. And it was, you know, she cried for a little bit, um, but then she was fine. And about 30 minutes later, she was playing with this remote that controls her, her uh the volume and the programs for her cochlear implants. And uh, suddenly she started screaming. Oh. And, and my wife uh, took one side of the, uh, one, one cochlear implant off at that point. And uh, we tried a couple of times to reconnect it and she would start crying. And so we took it off. Um, and, uh, so then we, 
we weren't completely lost because she still had one side. And, so it was uh, just straight up some sort of malfunctioning, maybe a bunch of feedback or something that, that at the time we had no idea. Okay. At the time we thought, okay, she fell. So something could be damaged to the implant, which can happen. Uh, and then you have to have a new surgery. Yeah. Uh, she also played with this uh, remote. So maybe she changed something on the remote, changed the volume, and suddenly it was much louder, much quieter, and that scared her. Um, we think now is kind of a combination between the two. Not any damage, but maybe it just hurt a little bit. Okay. And by putting the magnet on, it, that pain came back. Yeah. Attached to the, the volume change. But uh, so after a couple of days, we came home and there was one point where she had fallen asleep in my lap, taking a nap. And, and uh, I, I made the wrong move. I, I was trying to force her too fast. And so I kept reconnecting uh, that side yeah. and she kept taking it off as she was trying to take this nap. Okay. And eventually she took off both sides. Ah. she woke up and you know she would not wear just refuse one. just refuse to wear them completely refused um I, I pushed her too hard and um it, it was at that point man i i think i was grieving harder then than i was when we first found out she was dead. i can imagine the frustration you know you 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 said and this speaks to how how you feel about the situation and your part in it. You said, mm -hmm. I pushed her too hard. Yeah. And yeah. that is with all good intentions. That's with love. Yeah. That's with, you know, the, you, everyone mm -hmm. talks about a mother's love and that's a thing, but a father's love is there as well. Absolutely. And you just want the best for your child. Yeah. But somehow you're at this point where you feel like you pushed her too hard. That's a mm -hmm. harsh statement to say about yourself. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Um, and you think you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I'll never know if it was the right thing or not, but of course it wasn't the right outcome. So, so she uh, so she refused to wear her implants for yeah. how long? And how did you deal with that? How did you get her back to where she will wear them at least a little mm -hmm. bit? She was, it was about a week without the first one. And then which I think was actually the right side. Um, and then about three weeks without both. So a good four weeks, month long period that she was completely without. Yeah. And, um, and this is when you didn't know very much about sign language, I'm assuming. Well, we, we knew some, but man, we realized then exactly how much we were missing. Yeah. Because sudden, suddenly that communication between her was not as clear as it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of things that, that we just weren't capable of telling her. Um, so that, that was really tough and it weighed on all of us. I can imagine you would feel a large amount of frustration, um, for yourself because you can't communicate with your child, but, mm -hmm. but multiply that by a hundred when you put, put it from, when you take it from your daughter's viewpoint mm -hmm. and what she must be feeling and not being able to communicate as a child. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was getting frustrated. Oh, I can imagine. Um, her, her brother, has kind of been hesitant to, to learning any sign language or at least oh. practicing. I, I think he's learned a lot, but he, he wouldn't really learn it. And he's, how old is he now? Old. He's six. Six. Yeah. So suddenly he lost this communication with his best friend yeah. and that was hard on him, you know? Um, so it was, it was really tough on all of us. And uh, what an emotional roller coaster already at that yeah. point. You have the shock of learning that, she, well, first of all, you have the suspicion that she's deaf. That's a shock. Then you get the confirmation that she is deaf. Another shock. Then you get the uplifting moment where, hey, we can fix this. We can try and fix this. Yeah. And then you get an uplifting moment when you see that, you know, the, the, the implants and you're starting to learn sign language. Another uplift. And mm -hmm. then the crash, 
when she no longer wants to wear the implants and you lose most of the communication that you have it, with her. It was like starting all over. Yeah. Again. And we had no idea how long it would be. We've heard of stories where kids would go years yeah. without putting them back on Yeah, or for whatever reason. And so I was kind of ready for that. I mean, I was kind of expecting that. Really? It, okay. It a couple of years. Yeah. And so, okay, now is the time. Oh, I'm sorry, you were, you, you were expecting that after she had stopped wearing them, that it could be a long time before she would wear them again. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah of course, I was hoping it would be the next day. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, but prepared. No idea. Prepared for it to be a long haul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we did to encourage her was um, we tried to, well, just speak encouragement over her and tell her what a, you know, what a lovely girl she is and, and um, to also we showed her some videos of other kids with cochlear implants to, uh, to try to you know let her let it normalize a little bit for her um, where'd you get the that. where'd you get the videos from is there some kind of resource here in Norway that uh, that assisted you with that no it was just uh, you know YouTube just finding things on YouTube and and also I had a, a fellow author friend who also produced a, a book with a uh, main character with cochlear implants inspired okay. by her daughter. Okay. And so she filmed a video of her daughter talking to Esther. Um, and that was really cool. Yeah. And, you know, just to have that support from. Oh, it's, it, it's, you've yeah. got to have that circle of friends and when they're there, yeah. you've got to use them. So good, good, good for you. Yeah. Good that yeah. that was there. And of course you saw the fake, cochlear implants that I was. Wearing. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I was looking on your social media and in some of the posts that you had made with you wearing mm -hmm. that in support of your daughter. And I just, again, again, a mother's love is a thing, but a father's love is just as big. And you are a walking example, living mm -hmm. and breathing example of a father's love. I, I think it's beautiful, man. And Thank it needs, you. I think it's beautiful and it needs to be highlighted more often than it is. So well, I'll tell you thank what, you I'm for really all for all fathers. I say thank you for being the the father that you are and being the example that you are. You know, I think I think us as dads and moms, of course, should try to step into our kids' shoes somehow. Oh yeah, especially if they're going through some sort of disability or whatever. Sure. Um, so I learned a lot wearing these things for however many weeks I did. Um, I would wear them in public. Uh, it wasn't just in the house. I wear them everywhere. With, extended family, in the public, going to the mall, whatever. And um, first of all, I learned that I was much more cautious of people looking at me, even though they probably weren't. <laughs> I felt like everyone was looking at me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they weren't yeah. just admiring the beard. <laughs> oh, no, no. And the beard was a little longer then. Actually, I, one, of the, one of the ways I encouraged Esther was I told her I would shave my beard off when she started wearing her cochlear. I saw that. Too. Yeah. And you did. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. So now I'm growing it back again. But, um, yeah, that was fun. So, so at what point then did you, be, you, you mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation that you're given back after experience, having experienced what you've experienced, you're putting your story mm -hmm. out there to the benefit of others. At what mm -hmm. point did you start thinking that way that, you want to write this book or you want to do something to put out there? I didn't know it would be a book. I, it was when I first started the uh, sign language courses, really, that yeah. I felt like, okay, there's, there's a chance for other resources to be available. Um, but it wasn't until she was about a year and a half that this story just suddenly hit me. And I actually wrote the first draft in one night, which I don't really recommend, but it, <laughs> it just, it's just how it happened. And of course that story developed some over the next few months, but, uh, I, 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 I'm in admiration, but I have to admit there's a touch of jealousy. God forgive me because I'm trying to write a book and it's been taking me years and you did it overnight. <laughs> well, I'm guessing yours isn't a children's book. No, it's, it's not a children's book, but, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, you, you sent me a PDF file of the book and I read it yeah. and it is one of the, uh, it's one of the most charming books I've ever read. 
Thank it you. really grabs you. It twists on the heart a little bit. It made me put myself into that story and apply it to different things that I've seen, experienced, have had happen to me, both in my adult life, but also in my childhood. Mm-hmm. If the people who read Ada and the Helpers open themselves up, they're going to feel those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to put them, especially if they have a child with any issues, whether it's hearing or sight or any, any issues that they have to deal with, it's going to put that parent in a better position to be there for their child. Guaranteed. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's, That's kind of the goal I had in mind. I wanted it to be for all families and all kids, not yeah, just regardless with, yeah. with cochlear implants or what have you, you know, just, um, yeah, for anyone. Uh, and I hope I've accomplished that. Well, yeah. it's, it's written in a way that it grabbed, it grabbed me as an adult, as a parent. But yeah. I also think, you know, I, I kind of remember what it was like to be a kid. And I kind of remember the kind of books I read as a kid. And for any child who reads this book, um, even if they don't have cochlear in, in, uh, implants or, or, or any other issues, I think it is at least going to put them in a more uh, a position of awareness mm. on how to include, on how to assist, on how to understand. And that message is important for kids. It's very important. Absolutely. That message isn't put out there often enough, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, so you you know, if you read the book, you'll see that there are other characters with different, I don't want to call them disabilities, but, um, challenges, challenges. Exactly. And so Ada kind of helps those characters to find their strengths and kind of the, uh, the theme that is repeated over and over again is to help others. And that's something that we can all be reminded. Amen. Uh, you know, like I say, whoever reads it, whether you're an adult or, or whether they're a child, they're going to get something out of mm-hmm. it. They're going to come out of that in a much more reflective state of mind. And that can only lead to positive things if you've got the heart for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, tell me then about, um, because you, you, you've got a, you've got quite a um, structured effort to get this book out there to people, to inform people about it. Are you, are you self-published and are you doing all of the marketing yourself or are you having, do you have some assistance with, with that? I did everything myself. Um, and, and that's kind of, I think that's kind of the way a, the whole industry is going in a way. Like yeah. the, a lot of people are, are going the self-published route now. Because M- musicians as well. I'm involved yeah, in the music world and musicians are doing it themselves as well. I would imagine so. Um, it's it's so hard to get into a traditional publisher. Well, it is. And, and look, why why should we as, as artists, as creators, um, count on the generosity of some company that's not truly invested in our product? Right. We are the biggest investors in our product, so why don't we just – why don't we just pick up the football and run with it? Exactly. When it comes to the, to the production, when it comes to the distribution and when it comes to the marketing and promotion, let's just do that ourselves. I don't think anybody's going to do it better. No, (laughs) I mean, but, but, but there's a caveat in that, you know, the big publishers, they may generate more of a cash flow, but there's two questions. Is that is cash flow the most important thing about the product? for Mm -hmm. us as creators and okay, when there is a cash flow, how much of that is ours and how much of it do we have to give away to these people that, that actually are not truly invested in our product. So there's, there's something to think about there. And I think you're doing, I, I, I like seeing the way you're, you do it as a fellow creator. It's uh, it's refreshing to see the way you're doing it. It really is. And you know, I, I do have an advantage that I'm, I'm a graphic designer and I've worked with different publications. So, so um, I'm used to kind of that industry, you might say. Okay. So I, I actually laid out the book myself. So I didn't have to pay for a book designer, but I did. That's a big cost. That's a yeah. big cost. Yeah. It, it's, it's a big cost, but it's not as big as the illustrator. And oh, uh, so yes. I did pay up for that. And, and, um, I didn't pay top dollar, but I paid a good amount of money. Give her a shout out. What's her name? The illustrator. Her name is Melissa Fisher. 
and I actually found her on Instagram and uh, she did a fantastic job. She on sure it. did. Shout out to Melissa Fisher. Uh, she yeah. did a great job. I love, I love the illustration in this book. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, so I had to handle everything from, um, uh, finding the illustrator and getting that done, finding an editor to have it edited before the illustrations even began. Um, I reached out to printers, I actually found one in Lithuania. Um, so, uh, you know, I handled all of, all of that aspect of it and marketing of course is something I'm still learning, yeah. but, uh, I have to handle all that myself. And even in traditional publishing, authors typically have to do a good bulk of marketing. Well, you sure. Just you get traditionally published does not mean it's going to sell millions. That's right. You know, they, uh, they get quite active on the circuit. Of, oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> they get quite active on the uh, radio circuit. The, uh, they'll, they'll jump on podcasts, uh, book signing, uh, uh, functions and things like that. So it is a job regardless it's a bigger job when you have to do it yourself. But again, I feel that it's much more rewarding to do those kind of things myself. I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah. You get to hold on to that, that creative side of the project a lot more and and not release that to a publisher or a label or whoever. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Let's, let's back up a few years. Um, uh, I'm assuming you met your wife and you guys were married in the States, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You lived in North Carolina, right? I'm from North Carolina. Okay. Um, I, I was actually uh, in a, a Christian missions organization in Hawaii. In I Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay. She was there um, taking a, a course uh, in, in Kona, Hawaii, and, and uh, I was there as a graphic designer for the campus. Okay. And so we met there and we, we lived there and traveled a bit, um, together for a couple of years. And then, um, we got married and lived in Atlanta for a few years before moving here. Okay. Atlanta. What a great city. Yeah. Big city. I'm, I'm not a big city person. You know what? (laughs) I'm, I'm not either. I lived in, I lived and worked in the Chicago suburbs for seven years. I'm originally from small town, rural Ohio. Yeah, okay. But I lived, I lived in big city Chicago for seven years and that's where I met my Norwegian wife. And then we came here to Norway and everybody asked me all the time, was it, was it rough coming to Norway? And I said, no, it was almost a sigh of relief because <laughs> I'm getting out of that big city that I just didn't like. It was yeah. very fun and yeah. cool to work there, but I just didn't like, I, I can't do that city life. That's what not was me. it like for you moving from Ohio to the Chicago area? Well, I, I, I left my hometown and went to Ohio University, uh, a couple hours further south in Ohio. And then from there, I went into the U.S. Marines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of my time in the Marines, I was in Asia, in uh, on Okinawa. And then from there, I went to a few places. And then I finished my last year, roughly my last year in the Marines, in North Carolina, so you can say that since 1988, I haven't been home in yeah. Ohio. So it was a long transition that ended that 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 put me in Chicago. So mm-hmm. it wasn't a sudden thing, but but it, but again, I ne- I never never felt at home in Chicago. It it just it just wasn't my thing. It was easier for me to move to from America to Norway than it was for me to end up in Chicago. It was just, uh, it took a long time to get to Chicago, but it was, it was still something of a shock. The yeah. tightness, the, the rush, rush, the hurry up, the crime, the, the, yeah, everything about it was just foreign to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things available in big cities, but sure. Uh, it's really I would, too much. I yeah. would rather drive in to get whatever I want that's available and then drive back home out into yeah. the countryside. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But so you meet your wife and you guys start your life there in uh, America. Mm-hmm. And then you came to Norway. Uh, what year was it that you came to Norway? This was uh, 2017. 2017. About four, four and a half years now. And did you have your job lined up at that time? 
So I, I was working for a church denominational headquarters in Atlanta and um, decided to leave that and start my own freelance design business. Um, Good for you. And that was kind of when we were starting to wonder if we should move either to Norway or back to my hometown, Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, we eventually made the decision to move here. Part of that was because I wanted to get to know my my wife's family a bit more uh, and come, become closer with them and also learn her language and get to know her culture. But, uh, um, so I had my freelance business kind of up and running, but I will say after moving here, that network that I thought I had fell apart. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, big shock, and, uh, big shock, big adjustment, know? big adjustment that you had to make. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just the fact that I had to, I had to take these Norwegian classes during the day, which took all of my work hours. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, it just wasn't going so yeah. well for the first little bit, but, uh, thankfully, um, Writing this children's book, I, I joined a lot of Facebook author, uh, children's author books, uh, sorry, uh, Facebook groups for children's authors. And I realized that there was a big need for um, designers to help them to really put their books together ah. well um, and sort of, you know, make it look like any book that you would find on yeah. the shelves. Yeah. And, um, because that is an issue with some people. So- See, in, in the world of self-publishing, from what I've seen, it's either or. There's mm-hmm. no self-published book that looks, yeah, okay. They either look fantastic or they look self-published, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So Obviously. then here you come and you see the need for that kind of competence for that. Yeah. That's, hey, yeah, you, got, you got a good eye. Yeah, so I, I found my niche, yeah. you know, at least for now. And, and um, it's it's really taken off. Now I'm definitely not making the kind of salary I wish I was making, but uh, who, who is I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> it's, it's still a work in progress. But, well, uh, the thing is, is your market, uh, your customer market is, is international. You're not stuck to just helping people here in Norway or, mm-hmm. or just back in the States, you know, with the internet and everything else, you know, there's people writing books all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. I was on a call with someone in Germany just yesterday. So, uh, yeah, I'm helping people worldwide, which is you have awesome. a home. You have a home office, or do you jump in the car and go at, go to your cubicle somewhere? <laughs> I I work from home. Yeah, uh, in fact, this is my office here. Um, nice, nice. So yeah, it's a. Uh, I've got a small view of the fjord behind me here, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's okay. Yeah, you're out west towards Bergen, right? Yeah, and so I'm on the island of Sutra. So um, which is just outside of Bergen. And I'm kind of facing my window is sort of facing towards Bergen. It's a be- so beautiful part of the country. That whole area. Yeah. Beautiful part of the country. You guys talk a little weird out there, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I talk weird anyways, you know, I'm a Southern boy. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so how's it, how's it going with, uh, with uh, the Norwegian language for you? Well, I'm, I'm a lot like you. Um, I speak mostly English at home and with, with my family. Um, I, I've started to speak a bit of Norwegian with my wife's family. Um, they're, they're testing me a little bit and that's, that's good. You know, I can yeah. handle it. Um, and then I, it's mostly Norwegian when I go to the supermarket or whatever. And, yeah. um, so it's not a whole lot of practice. Um, and, and, you know, people are usually able to, speak English. In fact, I, when I go into a store and start speaking Norwegian, they'll usually re- reply in English. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. No, so, I, I, I love the language. I think Norwegian's a beautiful language. I'm so proud mm-hmm. uh, that, that I can speak it and it's, it's a joy to speak it. But when I'm at home, I like to just relax. And I also think about my children. I want them to be totally comfortable with, with speaking English. And then my wife or Snoopy, as I call her, she's got a nickname. Everybody in this house has a nickname except for me. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what they say behind my back. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I also speak only English with Snoopy because we found out when we came here and I was in that process of learning Norwegian, I've been here 20 years now, but I was in the process of learning Norwegian. So we would speak Norwegian with each other, but it was weird because we had already at that time been together for three years 
speaking English all the time. So speaking Norwegian was just weird. So we stopped. And we also found out that in just those first couple of months of speaking, of trying to speak only Norwegian with her, her English skills were starting to slip. Oh, okay. So we made a decision right then, only English between us. It's not weird. She'll keep her English skills. Although I tease her relentlessly about <laughs> the way she speaks English. But, yeah. uh, but the language is just, to me, it's so musical. And, and again, it's just, it's, you know, but, but I, I guess what I was going to get at here, I am, I'm wandering on my thoughts here, terrible podcast host, but <laughs> my, my question was, was that, uh, you as an American, um, self-employed here in Norway, do you see any challenges with that? And I'm thinking specifically language barriers. Yeah, I, I don't, like I said, I don't get nearly the practice that I should. Um, but does it get in the way of conducting business here in Norway? No, because all of my business is mostly in the U.S. I do have some okay. worldwide business. But, but uh, mostly in the U.S.? Mostly it comes from the U.S., okay. or at least English-speaking countries. Okay. Um, I've had a, a few jobs come from Norway. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not really an area that I've marketed much. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you don't think you're missing, uh, yeah. you don't think you're missing out on a market by not putting the word out more here in Norway? Well, especially now that I'm sort of focused on self-publishing children's authors. Um, I don't know how big the market is here for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. So, yeah. I mean, we don't even have Amazon here. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, hopefully it'll come, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just such a huge market. I have no need. I mean, a huge market in the U S that I have no need to try to work here locally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so where are you now, uh, in, in the process with your book, Ada and the helpers, where are you now as far as, I mean, are you, are you actively marketing it now or have you moved on to your next project? You're already writing your next book. So what's, what's yeah. happening with your What's happening in the writing world of Travis right now? Yeah. So before I, I've got a copy of Ada and the Helpers here. Before this there came is. out, yeah. Hold um, on, let me take a screenshot of that. That's a yeah. good picture. <laughs> there we go. That's beautiful. Yeah. So uh, I did a Kickstarter campaign to raise the funds to have it printed. This was back in September, October of last year. Um, and I reached my goal, so I had it printed, and it was formally published in February. Okay. And um, after that, to be honest, selling the hardcovers has been kind of slow because it's – I think it would be a lot easier if I was in the States because I could do more face-to-face uh, -face marketing. Yes. So that's really the key for – self-published authors, especially children's books, you know, going to schools to visit and do doing book readings and um, going to book festivals and other festivals. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of missing out on those opportunities. Well, but you could still get into schools on, um, because I know um, last summer, um, I don't know, maybe this is different because I'm talking now about, podcasting and the different subjects that I take up, but it's, it, I think it kind mm -hmm. of fits and can be relevant. But last summer I had a lot of appearance on video at schools mm -hmm. um, from like eighth grade all the way up here in Norway. Okay. And I didn't yeah. even try to expand that to making appearances at schools in the States. But I imagine that if I did, there would have been a market for that. So there's the, there's the video option for you to get into schools to uh you know to market your book just just yeah, an idea they, just an idea yeah there there are a lot of authors doing virtual visits yeah. in school but it's just not something that i've been able to break into you just haven't gotten yet. there yet no and i've been so busy with my own designing for other authors that yeah. i yeah the marketing side of my own book is kind of yeah. you know, taking the back burner which is a shame but that's just the way it's been lately. It's not enough hours in the day there never is exactly <laughs> exactly yeah um, let me ask you this. Uh, you're a Christian man. You've, uh, you've worked, uh, for your church in the past. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How has that changed since you've come to Norway? Because Norway is a little different when it mm-hmm. comes to their views on religion and spirituality. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So when I started my freelance business, I was really focused on helping churches and ministries. And um, so, you know, I, moving here, um, that need kind of fell apart uh, for, for local ministries. They, um, it's, it's just not, I hate to call it an industry, but it's, it's not really an industry here as much as it is in the States, uh, for, you know, for churches to hire professional designers and things like that to be on staff or anything. Um, so that was a challenge, but, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a different culture, uh, just from, you know, a Christian perspective, um, you know, moving from the Southern side of the U S here to Norway. Yeah. Um, uh, luckily I, I married into a Christian family. My in-laws are very solid Christians and, and my wife grew up in church and all that. So, um, we found a church here locally to attend pretty quickly. And, wow. and, uh, so that's been good. Um, good and I've good. been involved with an annual missions conference and kind of designing for them and things like that. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, you know, it's out there. It's, uh, yeah. I thought, uh, I thought to ask because, uh, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, and you had given voice to this in a telephone conversation we had that that's mm-hmm. a, that's always been a big part of your life. Mm-hmm. And I know that there are a lot of challenges with relocating from America to Norway. You know, I did it too. And I know the yeah. challenges that I faced and I was just wondering if that was a challenge that had manifested itself, but it sounds like it's not in that your wife shares mm. the same, basically the same views. You know, she's also raised in a Christian family. Exactly. So that made it a lot easier. You know? So kind of soften that transition. It was part of softening that transition from America to Norway then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. But I, I can see the challenges there, you know, it's, sure. um, it is different. It is, it is different. You're not, you're not really, expected to speak so boldly or, or so yeah. freely about your faith. Here. I can picture um, some Norwegians listening to this or watching this now yeah. and just kind of turning up their noses like, Oh my God, are they going to start preaching? <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, yeah, that, so but but where, the book of John, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but we're, we're laughing, but you know, that is, that is something that you, you almost expect to get that response from a wide swath of Norwegians, not all of them, that they will be very standoffish at the moment you speak of anything religious, which mm. is interesting to me. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying it's an observation and it's quite interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I, I get that sense. Yeah. You know, uh, luckily I, I haven't experienced that firsthand, but um, mm. I can definitely see it. Yeah. In the culture. Before we wind this up, Travis, I want to ask you to do two things for me. I've, I've been asking all my guests to do this, and it's turned into a little uh, a moment that I have on my, uh, on my podcast. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to say three words, and then I'd like you to finish the sentence. Just one sentence. Fill up the sentence okay. as much as you want, but only one sentence, okay? Okay. Travis Peterson is? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Travis Peterson is still trying to figure out who he is as an author and designer and follower of Christ and father and husband. Ne- a never ending journey. Just enjoy yeah. the process. <laughs> enjoy the process. A never ending journey. Yeah. Um, now, the next thing I'd like to, to ask you to do for me is, you know, you, you're quite the, quite the inspirational guy. Uh, I'm inspired by you. I'm motivated uh, to get off my butt and get my book done. Maybe not overnight like you did, but to, <laughs> to get it done. So can you say something? Is there anything you can say, anything you have on your heart that you can say now and put out there for my viewers and my listeners that can help them? go further on their, in their process, what can you say to them? What I would say is that no matter what you're facing 
in life, whether it's um, you're living in a new culture or you're facing some sort of handicap or disability or a rough home life, you have strengths. You have something that you can use to not only make your life better, but to make this world better. And uh, so use it, use your strengths um, to not only help yourself, but help others. Just as, you know, Ada the, and the helpers speaks, we should be helping others too. Um, so that's really what I would, I would have to say to, to your audience. Um, they can find some strength within themselves to make their lives better. There's nothing to add to that. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful Ooh. sentiment. I think people can uh, find comfort and encouragement from that. So uh, for all of my viewers and listeners, I say thank you. And thank you from myself as well. Thank you so much, Travis. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's been a pleasure to have you. Before we go, can, uh, can you tell people where to find you and where can they find Ada and the helpers? Yeah, so they can find me at travisdpeterson.com. And there is a link there to my book. Uh, but you can also go to adasfriends.com, and that'll take you straight to the listing of my book on my website. Um, it's, it's also available on Amazon, but I encourage everyone to buy the hardcover version because it comes with an ASL chart uh, that's removable that they can hang on their kid's wall or or wherever. So buy the hard copy, the hardcover copy. There you go. Travis Peterson, everybody. Thank you, my friend.